Good evening. You're watching the late news on Nishka IBC. I'm Sarah Wong. Here are tonight's top stories. John Lee, who will officially bid for the city's top job tomorrow, says enacting Article 23 will be a priority. COVID cases edge up as the government announces new visiting arrangements for critically ill patients. And at least 30 people are killed in heavy floods in the Philippines. Former Chief Secretary John Lee will officially enter the chief executive race tomorrow after securing enough nominations. I have uh, obtained so far, uh, after extensive efforts, uh, over 700 uh, nominations. Uh, I think it is time that I let people know the clear uh, indication of standing for the election. So it is appropriate for me to actually uh, register to stand for the election tomorrow. I will continue to uh, appeal for people's support. So I will be uh, approaching the election committee members uh, again uh, for their support in the eventual voting uh, exercise. And I will also uh, try to get as many opinions and ideas from them so that I will be able to do my platform, election platform, uh, as soon as possible. Lee earlier said that enacting the basic law's controversial Article 23 will be one of his top priorities. He also vowed to maintain the city's stability and security. Macy Mock reports. John Lee continued his whirlwind campaign today, meeting more election committee members and the Hong Kong Chinese Enterprises Association as he sought support for his bid to become chief executive. The former chief secretary said enacting Article 23 of the Basic Law is a priority and a constitutional duty. Hong Kong's own version of the national security law will prohibit acts of treason, secession, sedition and subversion against Beijing. The first bid to enact Article 23 collapsed in 2003 when half a million people took to the streets to protest. Lee said he has a broad agenda. National security, of course, is one area, but there are other areas such as uh, risk management, uh, contingency plan, uh, ensuring that our financial system is uh, able to uh, face uh, challenges and risks. So it will be uh, an examination of the potential risk areas uh, so as to ensure that we are fully prepared to mitigate uh, and be able to, to do well even if there are sudden attacks. The nomination period for the chief executive election ends on Thursday. Maisie Mock, HKIBC. The government is allowing people to visit relatives who are critically ill with COVID on compassionate grounds, but they must get tested and undergo medical surveillance. The concession came as Hong Kong's daily COVID case low went up slightly, when no one reports. New COVID infections edged up to 1,433 today. They included 13 infected arrivals, eight of whom flew in yesterday on an Emirates flight from Bangkok. The government announced yesterday it would ban this route for a week starting today because three other passengers were found to be positive last Sunday. 52 people died from COVID over the past 24 hours. Two were women under the age of 60. One was a 47-year-old with late-stage cancer that had spread all over her body, including the brain. The other was a mentally handicapped care home resident with a long history of blood diseases. The government, meanwhile, announced new visitation arrangements for COVID patients. Family members will be able to see their seriously sick loved ones if they can provide a negative rapid test done within the previous 24 hours. 
If that cannot be arranged, they can get tested immediately after the visit. They must wear protective gear during the visit and go through a week of medical surveillance afterwards. COVID recovered visitors can have the testing requirement waived for three months, but have to show related documents. According to Larry Lee of the hospital authority, the decision to tweak guidelines was due to an increase in critical cases lately, and authorities understood families would want to see their loved ones, perhaps for the last time. Wen Wang, HKIBC. Children and parents have protested against new arrangements under which students must be tested for COVID each day before going to school. This came as the authorities say schools can help administer the test to students who forget to do it. Johanna Chen reports. Starting next Tuesday, half-day in-class lessons will resume for primary schools. But children and teachers must get tested each day before leaving home. The Education Bureau says schools can administer rapid antigen tests for students who forget. However, Under Secretary for Education Choi Yuk Lin said schools have to contact parents for approval. Schools have to report the results of the students' tests to the Department of Health before 10 a.m. each day. Following complaints from parents, Choi admitted there is as yet no alternative measure to replace the self-administered tests for autistic students. The daily COVID test requirement also applies to kindergartens, which will resume classes in phases next month. <laughs> Why do we need to get tested? This child in K3 asked, I don't want to. It's uncomfortable. It gets very itchy. This girl complained. They weren't the only ones complaining. This mother of a K1 student said it will be difficult to test her son daily and propose spacing out the testing. She added it has been hard keeping her child at home every day. Other parents agreed. With this lady saying she will have to bargain with her children by giving them their favorite snacks or more time on the iPad. Parents urge the authorities to come up with alternatives that will enable children to resume face-to-face -face lessons while still staying healthy. Johanna Chan, HKIBC. The Polytechnic University has developed a portable device which it says can test for COVID as accurately as nucleic acid or PCR tests. We all know that as a gold standard, RT-PCR has very high sensitivity and specificity. And what we would like to highlight is that now our method also has the same sensitivity and specificity as the gold standard. And if you want to further compare our method and RAT, rapid antigen test, uh, rapid antigen test is fast. The result can be obtained in uh, 10 to 20 minutes. But the main issue is about the sensitivity. To use the device, a sample from a person or the environment must be taken. Four samples can be processed at the same time for up to 40 minutes, and the result will show on the smartphone. The easy usage means the device can be used in various settings, including schools and airports. The Food and Health Bureau funded the $2.7 million project. Train frequencies will be increased from Friday after being slashed at the height of the anti-COVID measures. This comes as the government gradually resumes normal public services and schools return to in-person teaching. The shortest waiting time is on the Chunwan line, with trains arriving every three minutes. Frequencies will be increased further from next Tuesday. Between April 22nd and May 14th, there will be extra services on eight lines between 6 and 7 a.m., so that students won't be late for their university entrance exam. Some residents of Shanghai have left home for the first time in over two weeks as lockdowns in certain areas were lifted. But the daily COVID caseload remained high, with 22,348 asymptomatic and nearly 1,000 symptomatic cases. The authorities have stepped up the delivery of food to the city's 25 million residents. The United States has ordered non-essential staff at its consulate in the mainland's financial hub to leave the city. 
for the mainland as a whole. New asymptomatic cases yesterday dropped slightly to 23,300, while there were 1,200 cases with symptoms. Diplomatic efforts to end Russia's invasion of Ukraine have run into roadblocks as the beat of war drums intensified in eastern Ukraine. India is walking a tightrope of energy security and international politics amid the growing impatience of its ally, the United States. The war in Ukraine grinds on after nearly seven weeks, with Ukrainians mounting new offensives to fend off the Russian invaders. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky warned of ruthless onslaughts in a country's east, where he said there's been a buildup of Russian troops. The United States has been arming Ukraine, but struggling to get its allies to cut off Russian energy exports and the neutrality of India, which is seen by Washington as a major counterweight against China in the Indo-Pacific region, has upset the White House. President Joe Biden directly pressed Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi to harden New Delhi's line towards Moscow. India denied boosting the Kremlin's war chest by importing Russian oil, which New Delhi says accounts for only 2 percent of its total imports. I think a big concern we have, and not just we, I think the world has, is of energy security, uh, of rising prices, of uh, increasing premiums, of limited supplies. So uh, today you have to understand it is a legitimate concern of countries to ensure their energy security. Diplomacy took a further hit when Austrian Chancellor Karl Nehammer struck a pessimistic tone after meeting Russian President Vladimir Putin in Moscow. Nehammer, the first European leader to meet Putin since the war began, described their encounter as a clear confrontation. Putin was said to be determined to bring Ukraine to its knees, but remained open to mediation efforts by Turkey. The United Nations says at least 140 children have been killed in Ukraine since the war started, and almost 5 million youngsters have been displaced. Children should never be the victims of a conflict and should be protected under uh, applicable international humanitarian law, but that's not the case. Uh, all across uh, the country, children are facing severely curtailed access to essential services like health care, uh, protection, water, sanitation, education. The scale and scope of the need uh, for services will only grow as the war drags on. UNICEF is also concerned that many of the 3.2 million children who remain in their homes are not getting enough to eat. The UN agency added that there is no evidence to support allegations that 120,000 Ukrainian children were seized and taken to Russia. Anti-government protests continue to grip Sri Lanka, which has defaulted on its 51 billion U.S. dollar external debt. <laughs> President Gotabaya Rajapaksa was blamed for miring the resource-rich island nation in its worst economic crisis since it gained independence from Britain in 1948. His opponents have been camping outside his office for a third straight day. They demanded Rajapaksa's resignation and the dissolution of parliament to make way for younger leaders. Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa, who's the president's brother, appealed for order and unity. The Hong Kong stock market received a shot in the arm today after China gave the green light for new internet games for the first time since July. The move helped boost the Hansen index by 0.5 percent to lift the benchmark from a four-week low. Video sharing website Bilibili recouped most of its loss yesterday to close almost 13 percent higher, while Tencent gained 3.6 percent, although neither firm had their games on the list of 45 newly approved titles. Now let's take a look at the markets. The Hansen index closed up 110 points. Top 10 active stocks, Tencent up $12.80, Kuaishou Technology down $4.75. Trackathon up 10 cents, Sinuk down 10 cents, and AIA down 85 cents. 
Floor is trading against Hong Kong dollar. Euro is trading at 8.51. Canadian dollar at 6.20. Over to the UK market, FTSE 100 is down 42 points. On to the weather now. Tomorrow will be hot with sunny intervals and a few showers. Temperatures range between 23 and 29 degrees. Some isolated showers on Thursday and mainly fine on Friday. Now let's take a look at the weather around the world. That's our main news for Tuesday night. Join us for more news at 11. I'm Sarah Wong. Stay safe and take care.